what's up? This is Lauren. She's my wife, my number one sweetest boo. And today I'm gonna show you guys how to make her favorite flourless chocolate cake. It's decadent, it's fudgy, and honestly, it's pretty bulletproof. Perfect for people who don't usually bake and it only takes about 10 minutes of active work. To get started, I'm gonna grab a 10 inch nonstick pan and drop it down on the stove over low heat. Into that goes two sticks or 230 grams of unsalted butter and 330 grams or 12 ounces of bittersweet chocolate. The goal here is to melt two things into one thing. The bittersweet chocolate I'm using for this cake is 70% cacao. The package says it's extra bittersweet, but 70% in my opinion is not really that noticeably bitter. To make this chocolate a little bit faster to melt, I broke it down by snapping it on the perforated squares that it came with like this. Feel free to use chocolate chips instead of chocolate chocolate bars and feel free to use a lower percentage of cacao like 55 or 60 if that's what you prefer. Once the butter and chocolate are fully melted together, I'm going to turn off the heat and let this hang out on the stove while I get the other part of my cake batter mixed together. For that, I'll crack six eggs into a medium bowl. Specifically, these are large eggs and if you want to match my process exactly, I also recommend that you use large eggs. Once those are all cracked, I'll grab a second bowl and then start to separate the yolks from the whites. To do that, I'll gently pass the yolk back and forth between my hands while also carefully letting the white fall through the gaps in my fingers like this. I'll separate the other five and once I've got six cleaned up yolks like this, I'll set them off to the side so that I can do a little bit of whipping to the whites. For that, I'll grab my whisk and then get started. But I wanna time this first actually so that you guys can get an idea of the labor commitment involved in doing this the old fashioned way. I'll mention that I'm going through the trouble of whipping these whites so that I can add a significant amount of lightness to this otherwise very dense cake. I trialed a few batches here using unwhipped eggs and it was good, but the batches with whipped eggs were just much better. So for me, it's a justifiable addition of complexity. After just about six minutes, you can see that I've got these whites whipped to the soft peak stage. They kind of hold themselves up, but they also aren't very assertive about it. If you wanted to use a stand mixer, you definitely could, and that process only takes about 30 to 40 seconds. But keep in mind that using mechanical force creates larger bubbles, thus a less stable foam, and having all that force makes it a lot easier to over whip the whites. What does that look like? Well, look at the graininess around the edge of the bowl here. That's the telltale sign of egg protein that's been worked too much. If you really over whip them, then you get this fully separated egg water and egg raft situation that looks just horrible. Anecdotally, I found that higher quality, meaning more expensive egg whites, whip better than cheap ones. On the right here, I have a $1.29 commodity egg whites, and on the left, I have $3.99 organic free range whites. Unfortunately, the cheap ones were a lot looser and a lot more watery, while the more expensive, nicer ones were more viscous and held the air I whipped in a lot more stably. The good news is that in my experience with this cake, it doesn't really matter how perfect your whipped egg whites are. As long as we're getting some additional air whipped into the mixture, we're benefiting. From there, I'll set my egg whites aside, grab my yolks bowl, and then add in 60 grams of buttermilk, 185 grams of sugar, 10 grams of cornstarch, 4 grams of salt, 10 grams of vanilla extract, and then a secret ingredient. This is an espresso pod from my Nespresso machine. Coffee is an amazing amplifier of chocolate flavor, and the dark, bitter roastiness will make this cake taste a lot more grown up. A less plastic option here would be to use some instant coffee if you have that on hand. I don't, so I'm going with what I've got here, and this pod has 5 grams of coffee in it. I'll shake that in, and then lastly, the choco butter from before, but before we add it in, make sure that the butter is fully mixed into the chocolate so that there is no visible fat sitting on top. That can make for a greasy cake. In that goes, and liquid chocolate is just fun to look at. This is like Wonka looking. Once the chocolate and butter are safely in with the yolks, I'll stir everything to combine. And once that's fully combined, I'll plop in my cloud of whipped egg whites. Again, no need to be precious about the exact amount of whip here. Just do what you can and get some air in there. Now I'm going to stir in these whites as opposed to gently folding them in because in my experience, even when I folded them with extreme care, basically the same amount of air stayed in the mixture. And there we go. Cake batter sans flour. To bake this, I'm gonna grab a nine inch spring form pan. And if you don't have one of these, that's not a sweat. A brownie pan would also work well here. Check out this brownie pan version that Lauren ate before I even had a chance to film it. It must be good. Next, into the spring form, I'll lay a round of parchment paper. Behind that, I'll hit this pan with a very, very liberal amount of pan spray. Or smear it with butter if that's what you prefer. I think all the eggs in this mixture make this cake extra prone to stick to the edges, and all that spray really helps avoid torn up sides. Now, the cake batter goes in. I'll pound it a few times on the counter to get any voids of air out of there and to level this thing off. Then I'll load it into a preheated 275F 135C oven to bake for 50 to 60 minutes while I thank the sponsor of this video, Brightland. 
Brightland produces super high quality olive oils and vinegars on family farms in California that are 100% traceable. With Brightland's oil, you can know the exact type of olives and fruit used in the oil or vinegar and the year of harvest so that you know it's super fresh and of the highest quality. There's no additives, no junk, and Brightland's oils have up to five times more of the antioxidant rich polyphenols in them than conventional, more processed oils. Right now, it's the winter in the Midwest, so I've been using Brightland's Awake Oil to cook my vegetable base for various soups and stews. When you cook with Awake, it brings a really nice herbaceous round depth to whatever dish you use it in, especially this tomatoey minestrone that's all about the vegetables. I'll garnish with the Ardor infused chili oil. It's super smoky and bright and amazing for either putting on top of soups or just wiping bread through. So start the new year off right by trying some of Brightland's super flavorful olive oils and vinegars. Click the link in my description and you'll get 10% off your first duo set. That's both the Alive and Awake olive oils packaged together. The duo would make an amazing gift for anybody you know who loves food. I'm going to be gifting myself the strawberry vinegar very soon. That looks really cool. Get 10% off your duo set. The link is in the description. What a freaking deal. Thank you, Brightland. 55 minutes later, when I pull this cake out of the oven, it should just barely jiggle in the middle when you shake it. Any more jig than this, and it needs to go back into the oven for sure. Unfortunately, because this cake is so soft and so fudgy, the traditional cake tester method of determining doneness won't work. I stuck this tester in somewhere around the edge where I was certain that it was fully baked and it still didn't come out 100% clean. Also, inevitably, as this cake sits, it's gonna fall a little bit. That's to be expected because there's nothing in there holding it up besides the protein from the eggs. Five minutes later, I'll come back and give it a poke to make sure that the top is fully setting up and that feels great. I'll let this sit for just a little bit longer. After this cake's been out of the oven for about 10 to 15 minutes and has had a chance to shrink inwards from the edge like this, I'm gonna come back and use my paring knife to go around the edge to help separate any parts that still might be attached. This really helps us get a nice clean edge on the cake. From there, I'll pop open the spring form and then carefully lift off the ring. Oh my gosh. Look at that. The edges are as clean as I've been able to get so far. They're well set up, they're fully gelatinized, and this just looks so pretty. Now, I wouldn't dream of cutting this cake warm because it would be a shapeless mess that would just fall apart. So once it's cooled off for about 30 minutes, I'm gonna throw it into the fridge so that it can fully set up for about one to two hours. One last very important detail here before I cut the cake is to make some tangy, sweet, whipped sour cream. Into a medium bowl, I'll add 200 grams of heavy cream and 10 grams of powdered sugar. I like to put a towel under the bowl to keep it from sliding around as I whisk it. Speaking of that, I'll grab a whisk and then whisk this cream for three to four minutes or until it's starting to hold on to some air. By the way, making a fresh whipped cream is a pretty cool and very easy party trick. After dinner, when people are sitting around all full and waiting for what's next, you can dazzle them by aerating the garnish for their dessert. Once the cream is holding onto some air and is capable of soft peaks like this, I'll grab 50 grams of sour cream. Sour cream is an absolute pro level move when it comes to whipped cream because it brings some mellow, twangy acidity that balances all that rich sweetness. Once that's in the bowl, I'll continue to whisk this for another 30 seconds or so, or until the cream is thickened just a little bit more but it's still just a touch loose and saucy like this. You want the final product to be light and airy, but not over whipped and stiff. When it's too light, you don't get as much fatty, creamy mouthfeel on the tongue, and instead it feels like foam and it just doesn't have much impact. Okay, time for the main event. This cake's been chilling in my fridge for over an hour now and it's all nice and firmed up. To finish this, I'm gonna set it up on a large square of parchment paper, then using my strainer, I'm gonna dust the top of the cake with some dark cocoa powder. This layer of chocolate dust gives us one last bit of interesting contrast in each bite, but mainly it just looks cool. Feel free to use powdered sugar or a combo of cocoa and sugar or even cinnamon. That would be super dope as well. The best way to cut something that is so rich and so fudgy is to grab a jar of warm water and a thin, sharp knife. I'll warm up the knife in the water and then very carefully cut myself a perfect, pretty, proper triangle of cake. In between cuts, I'll dunk the blade, clean it off, and then dunk it again to rewarm it. This method gets you the cleanest cuts, but if you're not worried about restaurant glossy perfect sides here, cut willy-nilly because this cake is yours. You guys, look at this. It's perfectly baked. It's so glossy, so fudgy, and thanks to all those egg whites, it's quite light for such a decadent, rich dessert. Now to plate this up, I'll drop my perfect little triangle of cake onto a BB plate, and then I'll hit it with a thick dollop of the whipped sour cream. The texture here is perfect. It's somehow both light and soft, but still firm at the same time. Next, I'll hit it with some toasted chopped hazelnuts because that really brings some nice texture that turns this from just a dessert on a plate into a proper, well-thought-out dish. 
Finally, I'll drizzle the whole thing with some bright, bitter, green tasting olive oil and then sprinkle on a nice pinch of crunchy, flaky salt. You guys, it's actually hard to describe how delicious and rich this cake is. It's so chocolatey, so buttery, and full of luxury. It's as fudgy as it could possibly get, and Lauren is very clearly happy with the final product. I wanna crawl inside it. <laughs> If you're trying to treat your sweetest little baby boo for Valentine's Day or you're hosting a dinner party sometime soon, give this one a try. It's super easy and it's real good. Let's eat this thing.